Why did you want to start teaching? Well, that's interesting. I was hanging around uh, Butte College, uh, majoring in watercolor and not really getting anything done. And uh, I wasn't getting transferred to college. I wanted to do what I wanted to do first, which was architecture. And uh, about that time, I had a critical thinking class uh, by a guy named Neil Snido out there at Butte College. He's since retired, but he was legendary out there. And uh, something about the way he approached the class really resonated with me about how you can get something out of literature and other things to make people think about, uh, you know, their place in the world, the human condition, etc. It was just an eye-opening experience. I'd been coaching ever since I got out of high school, too. Uh, and so I'd been told by people that I worked well with kids. So I think uh, putting that newfound interest together with what seemed to be a skill set, that's kind of where it headed. And rather than have to transfer and move away, Chico State is like one of the best teaching colleges in the state. So I was like, well, that's simple. I could stay home, stay here in the local area. And, um, and so it just kind of all fell together. Why teach at PV? Well, I think uh, it has a lot of opportunities. Like I spent the first 10 years of my career uh, teaching down in River Valley at Yuba City and always living up here. Uh, and I think, you know, I lost a lot of time in that commute, not just like, uh, you know, not just the drive time, but like personal time and stuff. And I think I always got into teaching to try to, like part of, I think part of the role of the profession is to like be a part of your community. And uh, whether that's, you know, through what I'd done before in coaching or other things. And so I think Coming back local was a good opportunity uh, that you know would help me get a lot more things out of my career that I'd wanted to do than I was getting uh, with having to drive two hours a day uh, to do my job. And also, I think um, you know all the things you get in your personal life, having that quality of life, being in town as the kid, my kids got older and started to do things around town, uh, that meant a lot. Why teach English instead of any other material? Uh, again, I think it was the it was the right thing at the right time in terms of seeing uh, how literature, vis-a-vis -vis that you know critical thinking class I mentioned earlier, seeing how literature uh, relates to telling you something about the world, to make you think and evaluate the world around you, like seeing it as a tool like that, and not just you know where you guys kind of are right now, like a poem. I don't like it, you know. That's, that's just a chore that people make you do over and over again throughout, uh, throughout your years in high school. Like, I wasn't ready for th seeing it that way when I was your age. But I think it was mostly like the f learning to flex those interpretive critical thinking muscles towards literature uh, just seemed fun. What is one of your favorite experiences while teaching? Oh, man. <laughs> I used to teach public speaking class down in, uh, at River Valley. And one of, the, one of the assignments I had him do was to make an infomercial. And, uh, and you didn't necessarily, you didn't have to pre-tape it. You didn't perform it there in front of the class. Right? And you had to make a prop for your product. And so these guys, this one time, uh, they made this uh, device, the devi their product they were going to sell was a, uh, a device for making it easier to TP houses. And so basically they'd taken a leaf blower and put like a paint roller on the end of it with a toilet paper roll on it. I don't even think they knew how well it was going to work. And so they get about 15, 20 seconds into their spiel and they turn it on and that roll of toilet paper is rolled out and done and all over three people's faces in like t 10 seconds. It's just like and everybody is, oh man, it's one of the funniest things in the world. And we had to reload it and make it happen again just to get it on tape to make sure it actually, like that was just an accident and actually worked that cool. It was funny as hell. <laughs> How do you think teaching impacts the lives of the students? I think in my class with English, I'm trying to do a lot to um, show you, you know, A, how to, again, be a good critical thinker, and B, also how um, the things that you, like how the things that you've been told to study over the years, how they relate to the things that you actually do love, whether those are the things you actually studied or the other, um, other ideas, other stories you like, other genres you like. I'm trying to show how there is something out there for everybody. Like I think too many people get turned off by, by content 
through the educational process and I'm trying to find a way to, you know, find the content you love or fall back in love with the content that you do already like. Which part of the year is your favorite year and why? Oh, man. I think probably, well, that's tough to say. I mean, the end of the year, even though summer's right there, is always so hectic. Um, I think probably coming into the holidays, like around coming into Thanksgiving, coming into like not as, like kind of that Veterans Day to Christmas stretch, right? There's a little bit of urgency because you got those semester grades, but it's not life or death. Like you're going to keep going on and doing something. The weather's nice, you know. It, it, feel, you know, it feels nice and cool, so you aren't like classrooms feel better and stuff. Um, you know, it's just kind of the weather I like, you know, rainy days, focus kids. Um, and I, I think you're starting to get, like, you're just comfortable enough, you can start to get into some of the, the heavier duty stuff. People aren't, like, don't have one eye out the door because it's springtime yet. Um, yeah, that's probably, probably my favorite time of year. It just has a nice homey feel if we settled into this classroom and we're all, uh, we're all starting to be like this, this group together that's working together. And, uh, and kind of the days go, the days start to go easy when you get comfortable like that. Kind of similar to the other question, what is one of the funniest things to ever happen to you while teaching? Oh, man. Uh, there's been things like, you know, I just think of funny moments where, you know, think people have said the wrong thing accidentally, uh, like somebody in a, <laughs> somebody in a, uh, in a presentation one time uh, made the un unfortunate uh, verbal faux pas of talking about uh, I think it was with a gambler's fallacy, which is like the idea that, you know, believing you're due to have something happen. And a kid was presenting about that and said something about uh, whether you'll get some or not get some. And he just turned beet red and everybody laughed at him. I think his girlfriend is in the class too. And so everybody, but everybody knew that wasn't how he meant it and he was a pretty good kid. Uh, I had a, <laughs> just the other day I had a kid in class accidentally uh, not trying to like talk back, just talking to, to her friends and said it said a little louder than she meant to, she swore. And I just looked at her and I was like, oh, my first shit ears, what are you doing? And she just, she blushes every time I look at her now, it's kind of funny. <laughs> what did your least favorite student do? You don't have to name the said person. Well, Diego San Paolo. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, man. I've had some doozies. I've had some people who lacked some of the basic skills to be a good human being. I know I've had people just walk out of class, all that kind of stuff. Most of that, all that was down at, at my old school, River Valley. Um, I haven't had anybody that's too bad a person up here. I'd say my most, like, love, like, a lot of my least favorite students, when I think back to, to uh, what they were doing, was probably evolving around the time that I've been teaching long enough. I can remember when phones started to become a thing, and... How people, how much people started to define their lives by that. I, I took a, I took a phone and spiked it on a desk one time. I was so mad and frustrated. It wasn't my best moment, but it felt good. What hobbies do you enjoy? Uh, probably in my own personal time. Uh, I, I like rock hounding and gold panning. I like stuff. You know, my grandpa used to do that stuff. He kind of got me into it when I was, when I was little. And uh, when he passed away, it renewed my interest in it. Uh, so I go out and I don't get to do it as much since uh, my kids have come along because they're not quite old enough to go with me yet. Hopefully here they'll be old enough to start going with me and trust them by fast rivers and we can start going gold padding again. But it's a lot of fun to go out there and find something that's kind of cool looking. It doesn't necessarily even have to be valuable, but if you find something, whether it's like a little gold or a really cool rock or crystals or stuff like that, find something that's cool out there that other people overlooked who didn't know what it was. That's fun. I, yeah, it's probably the main hobby. You know, I do some creative writing on the side too. Have you ever been out of the country? Yeah, uh, a couple times. Get out of the country while you can. I didn't get to travel much when I was a kid, so I made it a priority as an adult. I, uh, my first trip out of the country, I went to uh, Scotland and England and France on like a three week trip. And we uh, hung around Edinburgh. Uh, Took a train down, walked what's called Hadrian's Wall. It's the old Roman wall that used to go all the way across the island of England. Um, it was like 70 miles or something, and a lot of it's still there 2,000 years later. And 
and then you know saw a lot of cool things in London. Went down to went down to kind of the back door into the Brittany, the kind of uh, mid coast of France, and saw a place called Mont Saint Michel, which you guys have probably seen. It's that castle that the water comes in around. And that was really cool to see. And from there, I went up to Normandy, saw D Day, went to Paris, and uh, so that was a really nice trip, a nice experience for the first time. Do you speak another language fluently? Hell no, not fluently. <laughs> I just like torture you guys with little bits of language I can understand here or there, like bon chance. <laughs> bon chance. Uh, what was it like growing up as a kid? Well, it was interesting. Uh, I was out, I grew up out in Durham, out in the, uh, kind of out in the orchards a little bit. Um, didn't kind of an only child because all, all my siblings are either way older than me or uh, my younger sister is uh, severely disabled so I didn't really have like any siblings to hang around with or any other really neighborhood kids so I mean it was kind of it was kind of lonely in both a fun and a bad way sometimes you know but uh, um, Durham was a nice place to grow up like you know endless hours of riding your bike or playing games in the orchard or whatever I, you know I, there's a lot of it that I look back on and uh, and had fun with and kind of miss. You know, there's good times. I wish I'd gotten more out of it. But uh, yeah, it was you know it was a nice nice place. I definitely like would want to. I wouldn't mind going back to that simple life someday out there in the country. What was your first car, and did you ever wreck it? Oh hell yeah! Uh, my first car that was mine. It was beautiful. It was a 1967 Chevy Camaro. Wasn't anything special about it. It was just a little six-cylinder, but it still felt fun to drive. And I uh, got it all painted. It was like candy apple red. Got the little, the accurate, like the period accurate white bumblebee stripe on the front redone and stuff. And, uh, and that was a fun car to drive, but I had too much fun. And I, uh, I ended up uh, putting that tree back end first into a, or that car back end first into a tree on a highway exit on I-80 in Colfax one time because I kind of wasn't paying enough attention and also somebody was a little slow. I didn't see it. It was, a, it was like one of those really sharp uh, culver leaves. I thought it was, the look of it, it looked like it was a more a slower, more sloping one. It kind of tricked me. I wasn't paying enough attention to it. Survived, though. But, yeah, I missed that car. It was a lot of fun to drive. What was your favorite thing to do as a teenager or with friends? Uh, when I think about who was my friends when I was a teenager, probably my favorite thing to do was just go down to uh, go down to the creek and swim during the summer. We had a couple of nice swimming holes that we'd go to out in the Butte, out Butte Creek there in Durham, and or and or like watch like our favorite funny movies like uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail was big back then. I probably knew that movie, you know, three ways a Sunday. I could have quoted every line at one point. Now it's uh, it's kind of there once in a while. If I watched it, it'd probably come rushing back. But yeah, uh, mostly it, like trying to find things he's interested in, like that. Um, you know, what's a quote that really resonated with you or inspired you, um, or can you come up with one yourself? Probably one of my favorite quotes as it pertains to like kind of teaching in life uh, is uh, one by a uh, American poet called William Carlos Williams. And I think I tried to get it right. It said, uh, you won't find the news in a poem, but people suffer miserably every day for a lack of what's found there. Uh, what is your favorite word? Just to make you guys have to hear it, moist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what is your least favorite word? Moist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is the sound or noise that you love? What is a sound or noise that I love? Students leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Other than teaching, what profession would you like to do most? I think if I if I had been paying more attention when I was uh, in college, uh, it might have been fun. Might have been fun to be like a sports writer. Um, or some writer in some capacity. I also kind of learned later on in education about this idea called pub be a public historian, where basically you like professionally work in museums, knowing the history or preserving the, the history of things. I think 
some, that work sounds interesting, at least in theory. Uh, what profession would you never want to do? Mm, I don't think I could be a doctor. No way. Too much blood. Too much, too many infections. The things you see, right? No, no thanks. All righty, there we go. I got it? All right. Yep. Uh, actually, we have five more. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good.